Well, good morning, everyone. It is, uh, it is good to be together, whether you're here with us in person or whether you're joining us online. Uh, we just want to say welcome. We hope you had a, a great 4th of July. Um, my name is Kent. I'm one of the staff here with the church, but every once in a while, I get to kind of come up here and, and share a little bit. So excited to, to be doing it this morning. Um, and if you've been with us the past few weeks, you're probably excited too, because you know that we're in this great series, right, that, that we've called Be the Church. And, and really what we're doing in this series is we're asking this question, what's the church supposed to be, right? What, what's, the, what's the church really supposed to be? And, you know, we've all heard the cliches. We've heard, you know, the church is, is you know, more than a building or, or don't go to church, be the church. But I think in light of all the different noise and strategies and just ways and, and methods we can get caught up in doing the church, that sometimes we, we need reminded of, of how can we recognize what the church is, is really supposed to be. And so each week we've been talking about that, and, and what we've found in this series is that the answer to the question is actually really simple. Like, it's, it's not complicated at all. And uh, in fact, Jesus answered it over 2,000 years ago, uh, and he said this. He said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Right? That, that everyone will know that we're his disciples, that, that we are the church, not if we have this amazing worship service, right? Not if we have all of these amazing strategies, and I, you know, I, we do have all those things here, and I, and I love that, that we have those things, right? But, but what he's saying is that even more primary than all of that stuff is how we treat one another. And so that's what we've been focusing on in this series. Each week, all we've been doing is just picking a different sort of one another statement and looking at it in hopes of just examining our, examining our hearts, just asking ourselves, are we being what the church is supposed to be, really? Because let's be honest, like what the world needs today isn't just another church, isn't just another show, right? The world needs one another type of churches, and, and that's the type of church that we want to be. And so, so far... Um, We've looked at, at a bunch of them. We've looked at, at encourage one another. We've looked at forgive one another. Last week, we talked about admonish one another. Um, and this week, we're going to talk about bear one another's burdens. And this topic of, of bear one another's burdens, for me, was, was kind of a difficult one to, to wrestle with. Um, actually, to be totally honest, I, I met up with, with a couple of our pastors this week, and I was like, hey, this is like a hard topic. Do you think you could like maybe bear my burden and just go ahead and you know, take it from me? And obviously, uh, I'm here standing today, so you know that their answer was no. And, uh, you know, but, but the reality is that this isn't a burden at all, right? Preaching is, is, is different. This is an opportunity. This is a privilege but it is a heavy topic, right? Because we live in this world today that's burdened, that's going through all of these different things, right? We already talked about burdens surrounding those who serve to protect our freedoms, right? We've, we've talked about burdens surrounding racial reconciliation and, and unrest. There's burdens surrounding those who are most vulnerable to COVID. There's just all of these different burdens. We are, are a nation and we are a world that's burdened. And so we need to talk about it. And I'm by no means an expert on, on any of this stuff, and I, I definitely am not claiming to be. So what I want to do this morning is I just want to look to the Bible, right? Because I think if, if all of us together just kind of engage with the Word of God, then, then maybe we'll hear God say something about, about this together. And I think that if we listen, what we're going to find is this, that in order to be the church, we need to bear one another's burdens better, <laughs> Right? That, that if we want to be what the church is really supposed to be, this community of people that, that treat one another the way that, the way that Jesus would want us to treat one another, then we need to be better at bearing one another's burdens. And so we're going to look at that idea together. Um, if you have a Bible, feel free to, to take it out, turn it on, whatever you got to do. Um, I'm going to be in Galatians chapter 6, so you can, you can follow along or, or, or whatever. But all I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull out three things from this text for us just to consider as we're seeking to be this church that, that bears the burdens of others. So I'm just going to dive right in. Point number one, if we want to be the church, we need to engage the burden of sin with greater gentleness. If we want to be the church, we need to engage the burden of sin with greater gentleness. Uh, ch chapter 6, verse 1 says this, Brothers, 
If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, this isn't like a spiritual elite, this is just all Christians, right? You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so the first thing I want to point out from this text is that this text describes sin as a burden, right? It says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, and this isn't like, aha, like I caught you. Commentators suggest that this is actually more like, kind of like a bear getting caught in a bear trap, right? That, that people who are, who are stuck in, in sin are burdened. And so it calls us as the church to engage, right? We can't be passive. When we see sin happening in the church, we have to do something. When we see injustice in our world, we can't be silent. But it goes a step further, right? And it says that the way that we engage is really important. It says that we need to do so with a spirit of gentleness. And I think this is, is actually a really difficult task, right? Because sin and injustice and all this stuff, like, it, it makes us mad. Actually, uh, earlier this week, I was, um, I was sitting in our living room, and my wife was on the phone in, in another room, and I could somewhat hear this conversation that she was having, um, and it sounded like the conversation was getting a little bit heated, like just based on the way that, that my wife was responding, it sounded like the person on the other line was maybe like yelling at her or something, and so after the conversation, I went up to her, and I was like, hey, like what, what happened? And she started to describe to me this situation where this person was like, like just saying these things that were just not okay. And as she's describing this situation to me, just my husband, you know, defensive instincts kick in, and I just like, I'm just getting like really angry. And I'm like, babe, that happens again. You tell me. You tell me. And I'm, I'm going to step in, and I'm like, I'm going to do something about it. And she's like, oh my gosh, I appreciate you. That's amazing. Please don't. It's, it's just, it's just going to make things worse. Like, what's actually needed in this situation was, was to be gentle. And she explained it to me, and I was like, oh, you're, you're right. Like, that's, that is what I need to do. Um, but this happens with us, right? It is hard to respond in gentleness. Because when we think about things like that, people being mistreated, in all these different contexts, when we think about sin and injustice, we get mad and justifiably so, right? And so when we're mad about all these different things that we should be mad about because they're, they're not right, and we're told to respond in gentleness, it just seems off, right? Like, like, shouldn't we want to seek out justice for these things? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes, we should seek out justice, but gentleness is not opposed to justice. What it does is it pleads for justice to come in the right way. That to be gentle and to pursue justice, these things aren't opposed to one another. Check out this quote by, by a pastor named Aaron Martin. He said, when you consider that gentleness is the opposite of using force, coercion, manipulation, or power to get people to conform, we surprisingly discover that deploying gentleness as a strategy in conflict requires far more strength and control than we typically associate with gentleness. He goes on and says, gentleness is not the releasing of strength in our relationships. It's yielding the strength that we have to God and to his spirit. What if we, we looked at gentleness like that? Right? What, if, what if the way that we responded, that we didn't stop responding and engaging and doing all these, these things, but what if, what if we didn't view gentleness as passivity or weakness, but instead as a way to, to demonstrate our faith in God over ourselves? I think if, if we need to be the church, we need to be marked by this quality. We need to be a people that engages with the burden of sin, but we need to do it with greater gentleness. So that's point number one. Let's move on, though. Point two, we need to look at our sin burdens from God's perspective, not by comparing them to other people's. When, when we have these sins, we need to, to look at these sins from God's angle, not just compare our sins to someone else's sins. Check it out. Back to the text, verse, verse 3. It says, For if anyone thinks he's something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. 
wait a minute, bear his own load. So you, you might have noticed like some tension there, right? Because, because in verse two earlier, we said, okay, we all need to bear one another's burdens. And now he's saying each has to bear his own load. And so before you walk out, let me just point this out to you, that these are two different words, burden and load. And actually the Greek word for burden just means heavy weight. And that the Greek word for load means cargo. So these, these ideas actually aren't contradictory at all. They, they're two separate ideas. And the best way I've heard it described is like this. That the burdens are like boulders. And loads are like backpacks. And, and when you think of a boulder, what, what this represents is these are the types of issues or the types of sin in someone's life that are just obvious. Right? These are, these are huge sins and, and they stand out and everybody can recognize them. Backpacks, on the other hand, like these are, these are still sin issues, but they're easier to hide. You can carry them around and people might not even notice. They're, they're socially acceptable. And so what this text is saying is that, hey, whether your sin is, is huge or whether your sin, sin is small, we're all carrying sin, right? And, and as Christians, we believe that all sin, no matter what it is, makes us equally guilty before God, right? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we go around and we compare our sins with someone else's sins and we think, well, I'm better than you because I'm not struggling with this, and, and you know, we go back and forth, the text says that we deceive ourselves. We think that we're something when we're nothing. And this is huge in our world today, isn't it? I mean, you think about like the current just political climate, <laughs> Right? It's just like, I want to magnify the sins of, of the other sides, and I want to like, minimize my own sins, right? Because, oh, it's all, you know, those Republicans, you know, and, and the way that they're, you know, they're reckless with it, and oh, no, but it's, it's those Democrats, and they're the, the real problem is, and it's back and forth, right? And then we hop on the internet. And then, and then it gets even worse, right? Because now you're in the echo chamber, right? And, and you're saying things and it sounds real good when everybody just agrees with what you're saying because like the algorithms are, are designed in that way, right? That's actually a real thing. I didn't make that up, the echo chamber. Um, check this out. I, I looked it up. In news media, an echo chamber is a metaphorical description of a situation in which beliefs are amplified or reinforced by repetition inside a closed system and it insulates people from rebuttal. Isn't that interesting? It says, by visiting an echo chamber, people are able to seek out information that reinforces their existing views. This may increase social and political polarization and extremism. Some of you are like, yep, that is, that is the world that we live in today, right? And you know what? It's just all those blah, blah, and then you're going to the other people, right? It's, it's all their fault, right? It's all these other people's sins, you know, and everything that we read just reinforces the ideas that we had already had. This is not what the church is meant to be. This is, this is happening in the world, but the church is meant to be marked by something different than comparison. Philippians 2, talking about Jesus it says this, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is a picture of how the church ought to look. Right? It's this picture of a man who, who, who he never sinned at all, never sinned once, actually. And so if anybody could have like pointed out others' sin, and if anybody could have said, hey, I'm better than you and been like justified, it was Jesus. Right? If anybody could have said, well, your side is wrong and my side is right, it was Jesus. That would have been true. But even though he had that opportunity, he didn't do it. Instead, he humbled himself. In our world, where everybody's just constantly comparing sins, what would it look like if, if just the church did something different? What would it look like if just us uh, were like, you know, I, I've got issues and let's talk. Let's, let's, let's like embrace the middle. If we want to be the church, we need to do that. We need to stop comparing and we need to look at, at our issues from God's perspective. Point number three, if we want to be the church, we need to bear the burdens of others by giving sacrificially. So this is a little bit of a, of a shift in the text. Verse 6, 
It says, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And so there's this shift here, and we're talking about giving all of a sudden. And it says, let the one who hears the word share all good things with the one who teaches. And so I really like this part right, right now. Let the one, one who, who hears the word share all good things with the one who teaches. It's all about giving in the church. But then it shifts and it, and it starts to give this farming analogy. Uh, and he's talking about sowing and reaping. And, and I'm from Florida, and so I'm, I'm pretty unfamiliar with farming. Uh, but even me, like I get like if you plant corn, you get corn, right? And if you plant beans, you get beans, I think. And even for someone like me, like if you tried to pull a fast one on me and you took me to a cornfield and you were like, hey, see that corn? I got all that by planting a whole bunch of of beans. Even I would be like, that's not true, right? But what this text is saying is that this is what we do to ourselves, right? When when we only give our good things, our time, talent, and treasures to to ourselves because because we want to invest in our own, our own, you know, burden-free lives, when we only do that, then we expect to have this, like, this, this great fulfilling life. It says we deceive ourselves. We're sowing corruption. We're investing in things that seem like, like they matter, but these things won't last. The church is supposed to be different than that, right? The church is, is supposed to be concerned with the burdens of others, linking arms with someone else and, and shouldering, actually feeling the weight of other people's burdens and, and contributing. And this is one of the reasons why I love our church, because it's almost just like a part of, of who we are. Like, like I don't, you might know this, but pretty much all of our staff, we go out and we, we spend this period of time raising support and basically fundraising for our whole salaries, which I know sounds crazy, but, but it's, it's really interesting because when you do this, you have like this front row seat at watching people like invest in things that are going to last. To, to watch people like give sacrificially. And then even beyond that, it's cooler because then you get to see what happens. That, that people give and then the church is then able to go and bless other people. It's like this, this like burden-bearing machine that, that people, people give and then the church goes and is able to bear the burdens of, of the world. It's this beautiful picture but this is not, statistically speaking, what's happening in the larger church around the nation. 37% of, of regular church attendees don't give to the church. 17% of American families have reduced the amount that they give, and, and 7% uh, have dropped their reg- regular giving by 20% or more. And I know there's, you know, we're in COVID, and, and you know, there's, there's reasons for this, and, and totally, we don't want to be, like, legalistic about this or, or anything like that. But at the same time, when we're thinking about what we want to be as a community, when we're thinking about who the church is, we got to ask, are we more concerned with bearing our own burdens, with securing our own comfort, or are we concerned with the burdens of others? If we are, we're going to have to give more than than just our money, right? We're going to have to give of our time and our talents, right? Imagine a world where where everyone else is, is concerned with meeting their own needs, but where the church was focused on meeting the needs of others. If we want to be that type of church, then we need to bear one another's burdens by giving sacrificially. And so this is what we need to do, right? We, we need to get better at this, right? As a gathering of, of people who are the church, we need to get better at bearing one another's burdens. And I've talked about gentleness, I've talked about not comparing, and I've talked about giving, And here's how I want to kind of put a bow on it. I don't want to send you out here with with more burdens, right? Like, we just looked at this list, and if you're thinking, like, yep, you're right, I need to do better. I need to go out, and I need to grip my teeth, and I just need to, like, I need to get this right, then then I haven't done my job, right? Because we don't want to send you out of here with more burdens than you came in with. Instead, what I want to do is just remind you of this fact that we can't bear anyone else's burdens until Jesus has borne ours. That if we're wrestling with with this idea of, you know, I can't help anyone else because look at all my issues, look at what I've done, look at all of these things that are are going on in my life, 
then perhaps you haven't looked to the extent that Jesus has gone to to bear your own burdens. Perhaps we're not looking to Jesus. Isaiah 53 says this, that he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one whom people hide their faces, he was despised and held in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain, he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought, brought peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That Jesus went to, to great lengths to bear our burdens. And so if we're feeling like we can't go out and, and we can't do anything because I've got all of these burdens, man, this text makes it clear that he's, he's paid for those, right? That, that he took our pain, he took our suffering, he was pierced, by his wounds we're healed. And the question is, Will we trust that reality? Will we allow Jesus to bear our burdens this morning because we can't bear anyone else's until we do? And so, so here's how I just want to have us spend this, this next little amount of time of worship. I just want us to spend time remembering, just remembering what Jesus has done, just lifting our eyes above our own issues and, and looking uh, at the extent to which Jesus has gone to pay for our burdens. And so we're going to do that by, by taking communion. Um, when you walked in, maybe you grabbed a communion cup. If not, they're in the back. We're just going to sing two songs. And at any point during these, these couple songs, I just want to invite you to just experience in a physical way what, what Jesus has already done spiritually. To just proclaim and put your trust in this reality that, that Jesus has bore our burdens. And perhaps, perhaps if we remember that, we can become the type of church that bears the burdens of one another. So let me pray and, and, and we'll do that.